Okay. Uh, Boker Tov, good morning, everybody. Boker Tov. Thank you, Gloria. Um, so today is the uh, 15th day of Tevet, and I want to um, thank everybody for participating today virtually. Um, I want to first, before I introduce our speaker today, thank Sam Koenig. I don't know if you can see his face or not, or he's behind the screen, but Sam is involved, oh, there he is, Sam, in, uh, in development in Bar Ilan University. And it's a real privilege and pleasure, Sam, to be on this year journey with Bar Ilan University uh, to help strengthen the ties between our community and Israel and really learn more about Bar Ilan in the process. I also wanna thank Harvey Kaminsky, who's not on here, but he was one of the key catalysts for making this relationship happen. Um, it's really a pleasure to welcome today Professor Aaron Meir, who's an American-born Israeli archeologist and professor at Bar Ilan University. He was born in Rochester, New York, and he immigrated to Israel in 1969. I just learned that his family made a trip after the Six Day War to Israel because they were inspired like many people and that trip turned into a decision to make Aliyah. Following his service in the IDF where he reached the rank of captain, he did his undergraduate and graduate studies at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and did a postdoctorate at MIT, and he's been teaching at Bar Ilan University since 1992. His expertise lies in the bronze and iron age cultures of the Eastern Mediterranean with special emphasis on those of the ancient Levant. Among the topics that he studied are ancient trade, uh, metallurgy, pottery production, scientific applications, the middle bronze age, uh, Philistines, relations between Egypt and Levant, ancient weapons, and much more. Currently, He's the director of the Institute of Archaeology at Bar Ilan University, co-director of the Minerva Center for the Relations Between Israel and Aram in Biblical Times, director of the Ingerborg Renner Center for Jerusalem Studies, and co-editor of the Israel Exploration Journal. Since 1996, he's directed the Ackerman Family Bar Ilan University expedition to Gat, excavating the ancient site of Tel Es Safi, which is identified as Canaanite and Philistine Gat, one of the five cities mentioned in the Torah, the home of Goliath. Over the years, he's written and edited close to 20 volumes and published around 300 papers. Uh, just one point, I asked the professor, what are his favorite movies about archeology? span And can you guess what he told me? Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones. Jones. He said actually, of course, that even though it's a far cry from anything real, it has inspired many people to become archaeologists. So for that alone, it's worthwhile. Um, and uh, wanted to share that. And also just want to thank you. We should have much hatzlacha in your holy work. Um, really appreciate your time. Um, Professor Mayer is speaking out of Jerusalem right now. He's going to speak for about 45, 50 minutes. And then we'll have a few minutes for questions. So without further ado, thank you very much, Professor. Okay, um, uh, good evening. Uh, well, it's for Israel's good evening. Good, good afternoon morning. to you. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure um, being able to talk to you. And uh, as I told the rabbi, um, uh, one of the positive outcomes of COVID is that now uh, the world is open to online lectures. So we're, we are expanding our ability to share um, information um, in, in ways that we didn't in the past. So um, I'm going to give you in the next uh, slightly less than an hour, a very quick uh, overview of um, some of the recent new finds in biblical archaeology. And clearly, this is something that um, if you wanted to get a even an introductory course on this, you'd have to take a semester long uh, course. And by the way, I have an online course uh, on biblical archaeology. Uh, it's in the, uh, on the edX platform. It's called um, uh, Introduction to Biblical Archaeology. Uh, you Google my name, you can see it on the screen now, uh, with edX.org, and you'll be able to join the course. It's for free. It's running right now, right now and um, it's a lot of fun, and thousands of people from all over the world have done it, so you're invited to, uh, to, tr uh, to check that out if you want to go deeper into some of the topics that we're, uh, we'll be talking about today. And here, um, this is an aerial photograph uh, that at the end of every season of excavations, um, we, we gather the, the volunteers and we take an aerial photograph. Um, and then here we have uh, a photograph of a jar. And in the middle, it says got. And that's where I excavate Telasafi. 
And uh, the second half of the lecture, I'll be talking about finds from my excavation, but we'll start with some other interesting finds that have come out in, in the land of Israel from biblical times. And when I'm saying biblical times, <laughs> I'm, I mean the, uh, the period of mainly of uh, the Bait Rishon, the first temple period, um, and not uh, later um, finds. Okay, so uh, a little background. Um, the, um, the, the area that we'll be talking about is, course, uh, of course, the land of Israel. Um, the land of Israel, uh, which is uh, in modern uh, terms, as I'm sure you're familiar, it's the state of Israel, uh, the Palestinian Authority, and at different times, also parts of Jordan or also parts of southern Syria, also parts of Phoenicia. But here you have a, a more or less a map of uh, the kingdoms of Israel in the reddish and of Judah, um, let's say about in the 8th century of BC. And this gives you an idea of some of the, uh, the regions and some of the main sites that we'll be talking about. Um, um, one second, we're not moving ahead for some reason. Yeah. Uh, okay, now the time frame. Um, now, um, when we talk about the, um, the biblical period, um, we very often talk about um, several different archaeological periods. So I want to give you uh, a little background on some of them. The first period is called the Late Bronze Age, and that's from about 1600 to 1200 BCE. And this is the time when the land of Israel, uh, the people living there are the Canaanites. Some people would identify this as the time of the patriarchs or the time of the, um, the slavery in Egypt and then the Exodus. Uh, following this, we start the Iron Age, and we divide this into several sections. The early Iron Age from about 1200 to 1000, which is the period of uh, the settlement and the conquest, um, des described, for example, in the Oshua, Shoftim, and Sefer Shmuel. Um, and the late Iron Age, which is about from 1000 to 586, and this is the periods of the Israelite and Judite monarchies. Um, starting from David and Solomon, ending with the destruction of Jerusalem in 586. And this is described in, um, in Sefer Melachim, in many of the uh, Nevi'im, and of course in, in Chronicles. Um, and Jerusalem is destroyed by the Babylonians under uh, Nebuchadnezzar in 586. And then we go into the Persian period, um, which is about 550 to 330 BCE, 330 BCE being when the Alexander the Great uh, conquers the region. And that's the time, for example, of um, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. So those are the periods that we'll be talking about. Now, um, you can't talk about biblical archeology span without uh, talking about Jerusalem. And, um, and it's really the, it's the center of the, of the world, not only, you know, let's say in, uh, in geography from a Jewish or, or a Christian perspective, um, it's, um, you know, even to, to, till today, um, Jerusalem is like the the tinderbox of uh, of the of the Near East. Anything goes wrong there, the whole place goes crazy. And the same thing goes for archaeology. Archaeology, if we want to understand the archaeology of the land of Israel, understand uh, what's going on in Jerusalem. So let's look at uh, a map of uh, Jerusalem in the first temple period, and you'll notice in the background in gray. This is the, uh, the walls of the present day uh, old city, the walls that were built by the Ottomans in the 16th century. Um, this is the, the Western Wall, the Kotel. This is Jaffa Gate. This is Damascus Gate. So you have an idea of where we're looking at. This is um, the uh, Dung Gate and Mount Zion. So you, you have a more or less a feeling of where we are. And here is the Temple Mount. This, this big rectangular structure is the Temple Mount, which is of course, based on the Temple Mount that was built by Herod in the first century BCE of the second temple. But this is also the location of the, uh, of the first temple, the Temple of Solomon. Now, um, unfortunately, we don't have any actual remains or say for maybe something here or there on the Temple Mount of the actual first temple. But based on the description, it's quite clear that uh, we can locate it there. And then based on all kinds of finds that we have throughout um, the region of, of ancient Jerusalem, we can recreate more or less 
what was the size of the city during the first temple period. At first, during the time of David and Solomon, there was, there was, there was only a settlement in, um, excuse me, I would suggest that people turn off their, um, their microphone so that we don't get um, sounds in the background. So that, that would be helpful. Um, and, uh, and if you have a question later on, we'll, uh, we'll open microphones and you'll be able to ask the questions. So you have I'm, just, I'm gonna mute everybody and then you can unmute, it'll be easier, okay? Um, okay, so you'll do it to everybody and then I'll un unmute myself. Yeah, okay. Yes, yeah, 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 thanks. So you should be able to speak now. You good? Okay, hold on. I'm gonna. You can unmute yourself now. Okay, hear me now. Yep. Excellent. Okay, so let me move back to. Um, one second. You see me now? Is this no, no? This is the wrong thing. Hold on. Uh, how's that? I see and hear you. Yeah, we see. You see me now? Okay, you see the slides? Yeah. Okay, so back to where we were. Uh, so you have the Temple Mount um, and the, the long uh, ridge south of the Temple Mount, uh, south of Harvite, is what we call Ir David, the city of David. And this is the original location of the city uh, of Jerusalem um, from way before the time of David, from the time of the early Bronze Age in the, in the, in the third and fourth millennium BCE. And it was situated right next to the Gihon Spring. Uh, and this is where, um, when David came to Jerusalem, this is, the, this is the, the settlement he found and he settled this. And then Solomon expanded um, the temple uh, northwards. And then with time um, throughout the Iron Age until 586, Jerusalem slowly expanded until it included most of what we call the Western Hill, which is in modern terms, that's the area of the Jewish quarter, the area of the Armenian quarter, and the area of Mount Zion. And so at the end of the Iron Age, um, right before the, the Horban, um, and we just, uh, we just uh, marked the, the, uh, a couple of days ago, Asarabe Tevet, the beginning of the, of the, uh, uh, of the siege. Um, so the city of Jerusalem was fortified over here. There probably were houses that were over here. And this was um, the largest size of the city uh, for many, many years until the very end of the, uh, the second temple period uh, when the city expanded northwards and was larger than this. And this is what we have of Jerusalem at this time. Now let's go through some of the finds. Here you can see uh, an aerial view of the various parts. There's the Temple Mount, the Kidron Valley going to the east of the city of David. Uh, there's the city of David. On the west side of the city of David, you have the Turquoise Valley. And um, this is the very clear topography where you can see the city of David, the Temple Mount, and the, uh, the Dome of the Rock, um, although it's a medieval structure, it's more or less located where the temple, both the first and the second, uh, second temple were, um, were located. And this is a, a modern reconstruction of what the city of Jerusalem would have looked like right before the destruction by the Babylonians. Here you see the Temple Mount and the temple in the center, the city of David, the Kidron Valley, the Terrakoyan Valley, and the extension of the city to the west. Uh, and this would be the area of today, the Jewish quarter, the, today, the Armenian quarter, and today the, uh, the Mount, Mount Zion. And this would be more or less the, um, where the, uh, the Jaffa Gate is located uh, today. So let's start with some of the finds. So um, one of the big questions is, and, and it's highly debated, is can we find remains from Jerusalem from the time of, of, of David and Solomon? And um, in the city of David, the archeologist uh, uh, Eilat Mazar, who unfortunately passed away um, uh, this year um, found a very large building, which she claimed was the perhaps the palace of David uh, in the city of David. And while it's debated whether it's a palace or not, it does seem to indicate that 
in the 10th century, that is the time of David and Solomon, we do have evidence of substantial building in Jerusalem. Now, even if we can't say this is the palace and there's a and there's a sign above the door, this is the palace of David, we can say that. Nevertheless, it shows us that Jerusalem at that time was a substantial city, and it was probably the capital of a kingdom. Now, of course, there's a big debate. You know, it's like you know, like the fisherman, was it a fish or a fish? And was it a kingdom or a kingdom? Uh, I would say right now we know it's a kingdom. It's not. We don't have evidence of a kingdom that, that spans from the Nile to the Euphrates, but we seem to have evidence that there was a kingdom in Jerusalem during the 10th century, the kingdom uh, of David and Solomon. And even though we don't have documents from the time, as we'll see in a moment, um, there is an inscription from slightly later, which mentions the, the kingdom of, of David and supports the biblical evidence of the existence of the, of the uh, kingdom of David and Solomon at this time. And here's a, a suggestion of an artist's suggestion of what it might have looked like with the, uh, the temple mount and the palace on the, on the uh, temple, on the temple and the, te and the palace on the temple mount. Uh, this is the, that supposed um, large building that we saw a second ago and the fortification of Jerusalem along the, um, the, the ridge of the city of David with the Gihon Spring down over here, and those familiar, this is the, the, the Pool of Shiloach uh, on the other side. Um, now, as I said, one of the big issues is, can we identify the location of the first temple? Now, for this, we have several uh, great sources. First of all, we have the depiction uh, in First Kings, in Sefer Melachim Aleph, of the building of the temple by Solomon. And this is one of the most detailed descriptions that we have from the ancient Near East of, of the building of a temple. Um, the problem is, once we go to the location of that temple, there's almost nothing there. There may be some small hints, but the actual building, its foundations, and all the things that are related to it are not there. So how can we try and recreate this? What we do is, based on um, the text, based on other temples from this, peri from this period, for example, this temple in Syria, the Angara, and we'll talk about a temple near Jerusalem in a moment, and objects from the general area of, uh, of the land of Israel at the time help us reconstruct what the temple might have looked like. And for example, here you have one of an artist's concept of what the temple uh, might have looked like. Um, another thing that we um, recently have been, uh, found is, and some, some of you who may have visited Jerusalem over the last few years have may have participated in that. There's, there's this project called the Sifting Project, in which uh, um, a student from Bar Ilan University and a former staff member of, the, of my department um, have, took on them a, um, a, this long-term project to uh, find the dump material that was taken by the Islamic Waqf when they illegally built, expanded the mosques on the Temple Mount. They dug into the, uh, into the uh, fill on the Temple Mount and they dumped it aside. And although we don't know what this fill is and who brought it, et cetera, they started their project called the, the Sifting Project, which people from all over the world come and I think half a million people have participated in this over the years. And you basically you sift through finds from the Temple Mount. And in sifting through the finds from the Temple Mount and from other areas, they come across all kinds of cool things. And some of the finds that they came uh, uh, upon were bula. Now, what's a bula? Uh, if you can see here, imagine in the past, you would take a papyrus, piece of papyrus, and you would write on it in ink. You can see here a papyrus, which, is, uh, had, which was folded up. On the outside, it has the address. And then you close it by, you take a string, you tie the string, and right on the knot, you take a piece of clay and you press it with a, with a stamp. And this shows that the, the document is sealed. Sort of like, they, like a, um, uh, a lawyer seals the document officially, a document today. Now, um, in the Iron Age, it was uh, commonplace that on the seal, you would have the name of someone. And recently, Two uh, of these bule, a bula and in, in uh, plural bule, were found, which are fantastic. One um, is a bule that says the Chizkiyahu of Chizkiyahu 
a king of Judah, and the other saying of Yeshayahu Hanavi, Yeshayahu the prophet. And this is fantastic because um, we, we, although we do have quite a few um, inscriptions from um, the Iron Age, there are very, very few of them which can be associated with figures that are known from the biblical text. And here, not only are we dealing with some uh, official that's mentioned in the biblical text, here we have bullas of one of the most important kings, Hezekiah, Hizkiyahu, and of course, one of the most important, Nevi'im, Yeshayahu. And this is a very, very uh, special, it's, as I once said, it, it's, it's one of the nicest tweets from the past that we can possibly find. Um, very recently, a very cool uh, site was discovered. Um, and if you travel to Jerusalem now, um, I don't know if, who, have, who, who has been there recently, when you come into Jerusalem now and you pass Moza, you now go on, the, on, on this big bridge. And right underneath the bridge, they discovered a temple, which was partially excavated and they're continuing to excavate it now. Um, and this is a temple which existed three to five kilometers from Jerusalem during the time of the temple. Now, um, this is quite something, because first of all, the official ideology reflected in the biblical text is that there's supposed, there isn't supposed to be any temples outside of Jerusalem. And here we have a temple which exists right next to Jerusalem at that time. So what's going on here? So first of all, um, if it says you're not supposed to have something, it means that there was something. And just like um, we'll see that, um, uh, you, you know, there's a biblical prohibition about figurines, and there are figurines, and the biblical prohibition against um, eating pigs, for example, and people eat pigs. So clearly, there's a difference between what you say and what you do. So that's one thing. The other thing that's fascinating about this uh, temple is this temple is in many aspects similar in its plan to the description of the temple in Jerusalem in the book of Kings. So as I said before, we don't have the temple in Jerusalem, but we, based on all kinds of finds from around, we can start to get a better idea of what this, uh, what the temple in Jerusalem looked like. Now, one of the fascinating things uh, is, uh, do we have inscriptions? And there are two inscriptions which were reported uh, a couple of decades ago and they were actually, uh, one was bought from the antiquities market and then it was in the Israel Museum for a long time. And then there was another inscription that, um, that was almost bought, uh, which supposedly depicted um, were objects from the temple. The first one, this ivy pomegranate uh, over here, it had an inscription that supposedly said, Kodesh Kohanim the Beit Hashem, um, consecrated by the priests for the house of, of God. And this was, um, this was found in, a, um, in the antiquities market. It was bought by some, um, uh, by some collector, and then it was donated to the Israel Museum after cost, costing something like $800,000. And um, to make the story short, in the end, it turned out to be a, a fraud. The same thing happened. An inscription appeared on the antiquities market, which supposedly was depicted um, the events that are mentioned in the Book of Kings, in which Jehoash, the king of Judah, um, refurbishes the temple. And again, this was a big uh, splash in the media, but in the end, based on both epigraphy and analysis of the object itself, it turned into a fraud. Into a, in, into a, it, we realize now it's a forgery. Now, this is an important point because um, objects relating to the biblical period are sexy and uh, collectors will pay hundreds of thousands and sometimes millions of dollars for them. So if you have a, 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 a very talented forger, he can make a lot of money. And, the, and if you, and you add into this the temple, this becomes something um, unbelievable. And if you add in something mentioning a biblical event, that's even better. And so there are a lot of objects out there that, that forgers have tried to sell um, to the museums, to the collectors, and every once in a while, you'll find out that 
uh, some object that was for many, many years in a museum has been marked off, taken off the shelf because it's not, it's not, it's recognized as not being legitimate. And this, by the way, is one of the reasons is that we archaeologists say that you should only, only collect uh, objects that come from uh, excavations conducted by archaeologists. And those are the ones that should go to the museums. Anything else can, is suspect. And that's a big problem. And we have to try to not deal with that. Now, another very, very interesting site was which was excavated not too long ago by an archaeologist from the Hebrew University by the name of Yossi Garfenko is a site called Herbit Kayafa. And there, uh, on the about halfway between Jerusalem and the site that I excavate, uh, Philistine got, um, they, they found, he found a fortified site, which dates to the very beginning of the 10th century. And uh, he claims that this is a fortification built by King David. Now, if so, this shows very nicely that the kingdom during the time of King David was not only in Jerusalem, but expanded to, let's say, about 30 kilometers from the site. Now, if you go another 15 westwards, you hit a Philistine God, and a Philistine God didn't belong to David. But so it was an enormous kingdom, but nevertheless, there was a, uh, uh, the kingdom was at least one day walk um, in expanse. Now, this has been highly debated. There was some do accept it as David, some don't, but this is proof that during the 10th century, the region was was developing. There were things going on, and I personally, I I think that's just probably the most logical explanation is that it's connected to um, the kingdom of David. And one of the interesting finds from the uh, from this uh, uh, excavation is a a long inscription, what we call an ostracon, on a big shirt, and written in what we call archaic alphabetic Hebrew letters. And for example. Um, this is a taf, this is an ayin, this is an aleph, and you would think it's very clear, but there are five, six, seven different interpretations of what's written here, and it's not clear. And this is one of the interpretations, and it's written in a language which is very similar to the language of the biblical Hebrew we know from the, um, from the, from the biblical text. But again, who wrote this? What's written, what's its significance is, is highly debated. But what it does tell us that in the 10th century, the people at Hirbit Kayafa, and some have suggested this might be Sha'arayim, uh, a, a site mentioned in the early context, uh, and it's that they knew how to write, that there was a use of language and writing at the time. And among other things, they found a couple of um, structures with, uh, with cultic remains, and two of the interesting finds were models of temples, um, very schematic. And these models of temples, surprisingly, for example, the, the two pillars at the front of, the, of, the, of this model remind us of the two pillars depicted uh, in the Book of Kings of the temple in Jerusalem, where if you recall, they're called Yachim and Boaz. Um, now, up until 30 years ago, many biblical historians would say, we have absolutely no evidence that there ever was a king by the name of David. There's a biblical tradition, but we don't know when this biblical tradition appeared. Uh, how do we know that this, this, this supposed king, David, was not a figment of uh, the imagination of some later um, Judite or Israelite king? How do we know this? There's no extra biblical text. And, uh, and we as historians, we have to be critical. We, we can't base our analysis only on the biblical text, we need extra biblical, uh, another text that, and then um, 30 years ago, uh, in the excavations of the city of Dan in Northern Israel, um, in the pavement outside the city gate, this is the city gate and this is the pavement, they found a, uh, an inscription written in Aramaic, which had been put up apparently by Hazael, the king of Aram Damascus, when he had captured the city, around 830, 840 BCE. And then a few years later, the Israelites captured the city back, took the inscription that they had made and broke it down and used the, the stones from the inscription for the paving of the, of the plaza in front of, the, in front of this uh, gate. And then luckily, 
Um, three of the fragments from this inscription were found, and it's a long inscription, but what it's most important, it says in, in, in Rose 8 and 9, Melech Yisrael, that's over here, Melech Yisrael, and Melech Beit David, Beit David, the house of David. Now, this inscription dates from the mid 9th century BCE. David lived in the early 10th century BC. So this is about 100, 150 years after David. So it's not an inscription from the time of David, but it tells us that a century or so after the time of David, people in this region remembered that the, that the kingdom of Judah was founded by a guy named David. And it, the, the kingdom was called at that time, the house of David. So this was the first extra biblical evidence that we have of David from a non-biblical source. And this suddenly showed us clearly that despite skepticism, there was a David. Even if you, even if you put aside the Bible for a second, we have a, a very clear source showing us that there was a, a figure by the name of David. And since then, there may be another source which mentions this uh, as well. And this is a very important um, aspect because it, it changed the, uh, the narrative on how we talk about the early kings of, of Israel. So let's go on. Um, at a site um, north of Jerusalem in the Beit Shan Valley, um, just south of the city of Beit Shan, um, a large site um, by the name of Rehov was excavated by a team led by uh, Professor Amichai Mazar from the Hebrew University, who, by the way, was my doctoral advisor. And this is a large site from the time of the first temple. And very, very interesting, despite the fact that it's a large site and apparently an important site, it's not mentioned in the biblical text. And this is an important point because the biblical text is not a, his it's not a history book. It's not a geography book. It tells us a lot of information about history and geography, but when they relate to the specific stories that the biblical writers want to convey. So for example, for some reason, even though this was an important site, it's not mentioned. Now, one of the interesting finds they found in this uh, site is an, um, an area where they, um, where they conducted beekeeping. And this is the earliest physical evidence of beekeeping that we have in the, in the land of Israel. And this is very interesting because we always call uh, Israel land of milk and honey. And, and the, the, the seven species, Shibata Minim, uh, include honey. And we all say, and the question is, is it really honey? And for many years, they said, no, it's not honey. It's made out of, uh, it's honey made from dates. And they never found actual honey. And here we have uh, evidence of, uh, of beekeeping. They've shown this, the residues within the, uh, the hives, clearly honey. They even found um, um, fragments of body parts of bees in, within this, in the honey. Um, and it's very interesting, right next to it, they found a cultic area in which they had chalices, that means um, um, big cups on a foot, which they put honey as an offering. Now, this is very interesting because honey is one of the, the big isurim. You're not allowed to use honey um, in, in the Israelite cult. And again, this shows that you have what you're supposed to do, at least according to the biblical text, and then you have the actual practice, which doesn't necessarily, um, uh, it, it's not necessarily the same. Now, going back to Jerusalem, uh, one of the most important finds that we have from um, the Iron Age, and this was already found close to uh, 40 years ago, um, in, a, in a tomb, from the very end of the Iron Age, that means right before the destruction of Jerusalem by uh, the Babylonians, let's say around 600, in um, one of the tombs, they have, I'll stop for a second, there's a very interesting one, in late Iron Age times, in the first temple, when they would bury somebody, you would be buried in a tomb, and you would place on these, um, these like bed-like platforms, and a year or two later, when someone else in your family died and you opened up the tomb again to bury that someone else, you took the, the bones from the person who had buried a few years ago and you put it in, a, in a, another room below the tomb. You can see the opening here, what we call a repository. 
And then over the years, you would slowly push the, the remnants of the previous burials into this, um, into this like repository. And that's why, by the way, when you when the biblical text tells tells us Ben Esafel Abutab and he was gathered to his forefathers, it's it's physically also. It's not only that. It's not only metaphorically that you're in the same pile of bones as your forefathers. And um, they would take all the finds that were found with were with the original burials and and thrown inside. And among those finds that were found in this in this repositories here were two silver scrolls, which have on it. The so-called priestly blessing, which we all know say to, uh, say, said till today, and comes from Dvarim, Bamidbar, and Bamidbar Vav, and this is a an astounding find because it's the earliest portion of the biblical text which has been found. The next in line is from the second century BCE. That's like 400 years later, 500 years later from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this is the evidence that A, that the biblical text was being written down, portions of the biblical text were used in this context. And also a very interesting question is, what was the use of this? Now, um, there's an interesting clue to this is that in, um, in Egypt, during the Persian period, the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, in the southern Egypt, uh, near Aswan, near the Aswan Dam, there was an island called Elephantine. And on that island, the Persians had put a, um, how are we doing for time? Um, okay. Uh, the Persian um, Empire had put a, a garrison there which had Jewish soldiers. And in the, luckily for us, we found a cache of, uh, of Aramaic letters. And one of them mentions Tfilin Ziksaf. Tfilin? made out of silver. So one of the suggestions is, is that perhaps these rolled amulets with the portions from the Bible might have served in first temple times, which had a, a function similar to what later the tefillin did. And the earliest tefillin we have, the actual remains of tefillin that we have come from, um, from the Qumran, from the Dead Sea, Dead sea area in the late second temple period. So that might be how we know the tefillin today, or even then it's different, but how it started developing in the second temple period. Perhaps the tefillin that we know of in the first temple period were something very different, such as silver scrolls, but again, with portions from the biblical text, just as the, uh, the tefillin of today. Okay, so now I get a, a, some survey uh, of some, some of the interesting finds the biblical archaeology. Let's go to the site that I, exca that I excavate, Tel Asafi, got to the Philistines, located about halfway be uh, between Jerusalem and Ashkelon, in the zone, uh, the region that we call in biblical uh, geography um, Philistia. That means the southern coastal plain, the area more or less between Tel Aviv and Gaza uh, in the south. And this is the region where the various Philistine cities were, Gaza, Ashkelon, and Ashdod, on the coast, Ekron and Gath inland, what we call sometimes the, the Chameshet Arei Sarnea Plishtim, the five cities, the Pentapolis of the, the Philistine Saranian. The Saran is a leader of the Philistines. And here you can see the city of Gath. Um, uh, it's just on the border between the Judean foothills and the, and the uh, coastal plain. Here you can see Ashkelon, Gaza, and the uh, the northern coast of Sinai, and here you can see the Elah Valley and the site of, uh, of uh, Hirbe Kayaf, which I just mentioned a moment ago, is right over here. Now, the site is a very large site, and, um, and you can see it from many, many regions, and one of the characteristic aspects of the site is its white chalk cliffs that you have on its northwest site, and this is a fact. The reason why the site is called in Arabic Tel Asafi Esafi in Arabic means something like pure. And so uh, since it has white cliffs, it's considered pure. Now, it turns out that this is an enormous site and that in addition to this very large mound, Tel, with many, many layers, there's a very big um, nor, uh, lower city to the north of the site. And in fact, during the Iron Age, it was perhaps the largest city in the land, even larger than Jerusalem. 
And here's a map of the city and you can see the, the upper city and the lower city and all the various excavation areas that we've been excavating for, for 25 years. And you can see here the upper city and the lower city. And here we're look, looking westwards to the Mediterranean. And one of the things that we put a, a very strong focus in our work is to use cutting edge interdisciplinary research um, in the study of the past. And that means not only bringing the finds to the laboratories after the excavation, but actually bringing the scientists into the field. Now, why is that so important? Because when we think of archeology, span when the finds that we have represent only a very small amount of what actually happened, because most of the finds, that, uh, most of the objects from the past haven't survived. So imagine, think of the um, archeology, span it's like a, a 10,000 piece crossword puzzle, um, jigsaw puzzle, where we only have 300 pieces left, they don't connect, and they even give us the, the, the picture on the box. So we have to use any type of um, uh, analytic perspective that we can to understand the past. And by using methods from the exact sciences, from biological sciences, from the geological sciences, we expand our ability to understand the past. And so, for example, using DNA and isotope analysis and carbon-14 and geochemistry and studying plant remains, etc. All this gives, a, gives us more abilities to understand uh, what's going on in the past. Now, we're going to focus now on the Iron Age, because this is the time that this site was the um, settled by the Philistines. So let's give a little background. Around 1200, the end of the Late Bronze Age, the beginning of the Iron Age, we have this big change in the world. The, um, the Hittite Empire, the Egyptian Empire falls apart. The Mycenaean uh, kingdoms fall apart. This is the time of the, of the, of the Trojan War. Um, in the land of Israel, um, this is the time when the Israelites appear, when the Philistines appear, when the uh, Arameans appear, the Edomites, the Anomite, Ammonites, etc., it's a period of, of, as we would say in Hebrew, balagan, a big mess, and um, everything changes. And among other things, we have the appearance of a new culture, which we call the Philistines, and they bring with them um, uh, archaeological finds, material culture, which is very, very different from that of uh, that we know of um, prior, and. Apparently, the Philistines, a big portion of them came from the area that we would call nowadays modern Greece, from the what was then called the Mycenaean uh, culture. And they bring with them, for example, unique pottery. And they bring with them um, new, new habits, for example, of diet. And, and for example, the Philistines eat pig and dog meat. The Canaanites and the Israelites, for the most part, don't. Although, as I said before, it's not a black and white. And for example, just recently in the destruction level of the end of, of, uh, of uh, Jerusalem in 586, the Babylonian destruction, they found a pig skeleton, meaning that not everybody um, did eat pig. But in any case, perhaps the, 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 the inclination not to eat pig and dog might be evidence of the earliest manifestations of the traditions that we now call Kashrut, that they were beginning in the Iron Age in a very incipient, incipient manner, but then nevertheless, they were beginning to appear. Now, a fantastic thing that we have at our site, and I'm trying to run through this, the finds very quickly, because you don't have a lot of time, is um, in Melachim Bet, 12, 17, or 18, depending on which version of the Bible we use, uh, it mentions that Hazael, the king of Aram, uh, besieges God and destroys it. And wherever we excavated on the site in the upper or the lower city, we found astounding remains of the destruction of the site with hundreds and hundreds of finds of all kinds, daily, cultic, you name it, we got it. And you can see nothing makes an archaeologist happier than finding a destruction. And uh, the finds were fascinating. And some of them were, it was like a Pompeian type of uh, situation. Sometimes you had objects that looked as if they had come out of the potter's workshop the day before. And you could reconstruct what people ate and what they stored and what was in what um, in a fantastic way. 
And these finds included astounding remains. And, and one of them we found now three different vessels, which we managed to recreate, uh, uh, isolate from within the vessels, remains of yeast that had survived for 2,800 years. And we managed to regrow this yeast and actually we made beer and the beer was actually very, very uh, tasty. And this is something uh, quite astounding, you know, because um, we talk about, we, we find the remains of the past, you feel the past, and here we actually, we could taste the past, which was quite uh, something cool. And here you can see um, the astounding uh, preservation of the remains from this destruction. Here you see volunteers and, and students from Bar Ilan University excavating in the remains. And this is really, uh, uh, this is a, um, it's a, uh, it's a feeling that every time I do, I've been doing this for 23, every 25 years, every year it's, it astounds me again. You, you excavate the houses of people who lived 2,800 years ago, sometimes mere inches below the surface, and you find the objects that they had in their daily life when, uh, when the city ended in a destruction around 830 BC, 2,800 years ago. It's astounding. And you can imagine uh, finding a complete vessel. These are, these are things that once you do that, something like this, you'll, these people will be telling their grandchildren about it. It's, it's really quite a something, a uh, new uh, complete vessel. Now, um, uh, here we have example of, um, of uh, a, a group of vessels that were found together. And this is a cultic group of vessels. And for example, right inside the group of vessels, we found this little, uh, not too little, it's about this size. It's a, a shell which is, comes from the uh, Mediterranean. And very interesting, it's a type of shell that is also used in the ancient Greek world for cultic purposes. And this is interesting. It shows that the Philistines retained with them some of their Greek traditions in the, in the land. Now, um, recently we've been excavating the lower city um, and there, because after the destruction by Hazael, there was no remains uh, and no later remains. So we find the Iron Age remains right below surface as we excavate them. And we found, for example, a temple with tons and tons of remains and, and a, a fantastic altar um, made of stone. And this altar is quite astounding because it's made of one block of stone. It is sized is very similar to one of the altar depicted in the tabernacle in the Mishkan. Um, on the other hand, it has two horns and not four that we usually have in biblical altars. So it's an interesting combination of things that do relate to the uh, to biblical traditions and and and, th and those that don't. And here you can see the um, uh, uh, the the altar in the Mishkan was ama lama lama taim komata. So fifty centimeters is an ama. Very cool. Uh, we found it uh, right next to the altar, a jar, which when we analyzed this jar, it turned out that this jar was made by, made by, from clay from the Jerusalem area. And on it, it had an inscription, Avtam or Avitam, which is a Judite name. And someone from Judah apparently dedicated a jar to a temple in Philistine God. Now, again, this is this goes against what we would think Judaites would be doing, but again, it shows that the biblical text and the cultic traditions that are reflected there reflect only one of the traditions that existed in the time, traditions that in the end won out, if you would say, but there were other traditions simultaneously. And here, recently we found the, um, the gate um, right next to this temple, and among it, we found a door, which was still standing to more than two meters high, which we haven't excavated yet, and all kinds of other uh, cool finds. So um, this is um, a quick overview of, the, of some of the cool finds from archaeology um, from, uh, in the land of Israel, from our work at, at Tel Asafi. If you're interested in, in more details, go to our website, got.wordpress.com. And as the rabbi already put up, um, uh, you can see here the uh, the uh, the link to the course that I give uh, that I have online. It's for free. Um, and um, thank you very much. And um, oh, here you go. Here you go. There, there's the uh, the link. And um, I think we'll stop with that. That was okay. amazing. Yeshikov, thank you so much. I mean, 
I could listen for hours. It's fascinating. Um, and uh, it was wonderful. So we'll take a few questions if anybody has. Of course, please go ahead. Um, um, I've got Susan, Susan, go ahead. Oh, it's just, just it's just sort of silly, but what else might the pigs have been used for besides food? Again, I, 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 could you say that again, Clear? I didn't hear that for, uh, uh, very well. Oh, what else might they have used the pigs for besides food? Oh, um, well, um, pigs are actually, um, they're great uh, street cleaners. <laughs> uh, they, they eat everything. Right. Uh, and, and for example, um, uh, in um, uh, very often um, semen, would take pigs on board because the pigs would eat all the garbage, including everything, and then you eat them. Uh, so um, while pigs are also used as food, they have other functions. Now, nowadays, we also have pigs which are uh, pets, but I don't think in the past they, no. they kept um, Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Um, what do you think, based on your knowledge of archaeology, about the recent production of Tehillot at Kfar Adumim, where Rabbi Tavker has said he's discovered the, uh, he's discovered and confirmed that Murex Tranquilus was the source for Tehillot, you know, the blue string that we use in the tzitzit, and they were producing that, it's not a Jewish product, they were producing that around the Mediterranean especially in Tyre. But uh, supposedly, um, archaeological finds show dye works where Murex truncula shells are found. Can you corroborate that? Well, there's no question that Tchelet um, was made out of these Murex shells. We know that. Um, and they have found at sites also in the coast of Israel, for example, at Dor and other sites, they have found the Murex shells that they've had that you know, the, uh, with the uh, hole in it, because they removed the, the the body of the of the snail from it, um, and it's clear that it's used. I mean, there's no question about it. Yeah. No. Okay. Thanks. I have a question just to raise. Um, maybe you can give us an example. You know, certain things you talked about kind of just obviously have impacts on how we understand things within the Torah or just actual reality. Sometimes in our minds might be different once you have an archeological excavation. And I'm wondering when you've seen those things, do you engage in a dialogue with let's say other scholars or rabbis to try to help understand somehow to synthesize what our tradition is versus what you describe in archeology? span Maybe just one example of that. Well, I think, well, first of all, um, I think it's important that uh, as archeologists, we do archeology. span um, you know, we try to, you know, as, as scientists, we do what, what, what the science, uh, you know, the, the best methods. But then you take the archaeological finds and you talk to historians, you talk to biblical scholars, you talk to theologians, uh, and you try to understand how we, how we can relate to the archaeological finds um, in the context of, let's say, modern day Judaism, modern day ideology, etc. And so, so, for example, one of the things that I long ago said is to a certain extent, you can use um, archaeological evidence as a way of doing midrash on the on the on the biblical text because it's it's um, you know we listen it's clear that not everything that's said in the midrash is is necessarily true uh, and and sometimes it is and we can use the biblical text um, to interpret things in different ways and to and give us uh, uh, understand our lifestyle and the reasons why we. We're, we're here on, on the on the, on the land, um, and I think the archaeological remains, as far as I I see it, and again this is my view, is um, is something that I I I use to understand the biblical text. I don't use it to prove or disprove. Right. Um, you know, uh, I don't need to prove that the Bible is here. I, I hold it in my hand. I hold it in my heart. Um, the biblical text gives me gives me a, a richer understanding of the biblical text. That's how I look at it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Please. Oh, Alan, then Toby. Go ahead, Alan. Okay. Um, I, I'm interested in the forgeries that uh, come across. Um, I thought uh, carbon dating was uh, 
the most common method, at least uh, that's what I thought 10 years ago. I haven't heard anything else about okay, it. Okay, well, well, first of all, carbon dating is good only with objects made out of organic materials. So if you have stone, uh, it doesn't help. Um, and then there, there are other methods that can be used to try to uh, help in, in telling whether an object is, is a forgery or not. But the problem is some of the forgerers uh, have a very in-depth knowledge of uh, archeology span and material science. So they're very sophisticated in the way that they, they make the forgery. So it's sometimes not an easy um, uh, quest to understand whether the object you're holding is a forgery or not. That's why the best way to know or not is whether it came from an excavation okay. by an archeologist or not. Okay. When you, when you find an archeological area, is it protected? protected in any way or can you have it protected can, can i have what protected the area that you have found that you believe you're going to dig in yes um well um the excavations that i uh, that i run at, at telesafi that's a, a national park uh and uh, the the nature and parks authority um are are responsible for uh for protecting it when i'm not excavating and and up until now, in the last uh, uh, several decades that I've worked there, um, we've been fortunate there hasn't been any substantial um, robbery. Um, but on the other hand, there are sites in Israel, particularly in areas which are not visited frequently by tourists, that uh, have suffered uh, terrible uh, looting. And um, recently, um, a, they published a list of sites in Judea and Samaria which have been destroyed. Through, um, through ongoing looting. And unfortunately, um, you know, we don't have enough people and soldiers and policemen to put at every single site. And, and, and clearly you can't, someone's gonna loot it if, you, if they want to, yeah. Hey, last question, Toby. So a few years ago, I was in Italy and I was in the Northern area of, uh, of Balzano. And there's a whole museum there, I see you're not, and you know what I'm talking about, dedicated to this individual that they found, I think they call him Otzi, Otzi, yes. And, mm -hmm. and they, basically their whole exhibit is, is talking about how they believe he's from the Bronze Age, and this would be a prototype for what Avraham looked like, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, have you, uh, or other Israeli archaeologists, oh, okay, well, that, or Otzi, how, Otzi was a, just for those of you not familiar, um, uh, about uh, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, a um, a couple from uh, from Italy were walking in the in the Italian Alps in the spring, and they came upon the body of a uh, of uh, a body lying in the in the in the uh, half melted snow. They called the police, who thought it might be someone who had died. It turned out it was a body of someone who had died crossing the Alps 6,000 years ago. Uh, and because because it had been uh, mostly covered by snow and ice for that entire period, uh, it was very well preserved, including uh, the skin, the clothes, the contents of his stomach, the tattoos on his skin, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this gave an astounding opportunity to study um, extensively uh, someone from 6,000 years ago. Now, um, Abraham... Um, Let's say he lived about 4,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, something like that. Um, you know, he didn't live in Italy, but nevertheless, it gives us a view of people from the past. Uh, and, uh, and interestingly, he's, he's, although he was shorter than us, and he, he, was, uh, he had all kinds of diseases and, um, and, and arthritis and uh, poor health and, uh, and poor nutrition, he was very similar to us. You know, we haven't changed that much in... Uh, in, in, in the last few millennia. Uh, and it's, uh, that's one of the, what's by the way, one of the, um, the important lessons you get from archeology span is that um, the people that I excavate are basically the same people as we are today. We just have better technology. We have better, uh, we've better health and a better diet, but we're really just the same as they were then. Did anything about that find change any of our thinking about that time oh, period? Well, um, well, we, first of all, they learned all kinds of things that were never known because when you have the organic remains, the flesh, they, the soft tissue on this person that you never survived, 
first of all, you can learn, you can see the tattoos that the people used at the time, uh, <laughs> but also uh, what he ate and uh, the objects that he had, where they came from. You know, it turned out that they were trade relations throughout uh, Central and, and, uh, and Southern Europe that we weren't, we didn't know about. It's, it's a fascinating find. There's no question about it. It's one of the, and by the way, they, they, you know, we talk about archaeology and nationalism. So the, the Italians and the Swiss and the Austrians, I think, had, a, had this ongoing international uh, court battle who it belonged to until it finally was decided that it was Italian. And that, that's why it's in, uh, that's why it's, uh, the museum is in Torino. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will be um, sending out the Zoom to others who couldn't see it, but I'm you know, fascinated, we all are, by everything that you've offered. And God willing, uh, next time will not be virtual, but it'll be real, and hopefully not in Stanford, but in the Holy Land. So we should share. Okay. Good Thank you so I much. Hope, I hope you'll be able to come to Israel and uh, visit Bar Ilan University, visit the dig, and visit other finds, and uh, hopefully um, uh, we'll get over this. This horrible okay. period we're in uh, very soon. Okay. Uh, Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.